Very welcome, Miriam. Welcome to the show. Well, thanks for having me. So let's talk about that that film. Okay. Uh, that, uh, <laughs> that I watched that earlier today, and it just struck me as just a, you know, you take for granted art, right? But then in a, in a Stalinist type or Nazi regime, things go, everything goes out the window, all your freedoms and liberties go out the window. So yeah. talk about how that project and a little background on it. Well, it was a very dangerous time to be a creative person because in the Soviet Union of Stalin, um, anything that wasn't state-sponsored art was not allowed. So that's why you see all these, these all the artists were de devoted then to creating stuff that promoted the idea of the Soviet regime and how great communism was for everyone. So that's why you have all these smiling, muscular, gorgeous looking Slavic people, mm -hmm. you know, in all these works of art. But there was a tremendous um, history and um, of, of these artists that had been doing stuff that was very close to what was going on in Europe at the time. You know, it was like Gauguin and, mm -hmm. and Picasso, and there were things like that going on in Russia, but it was all forbidden. So these people were put in gulags, and some sometimes they were shot. Um, and how'd you get involved with the film? Oh well, I I move. You know, I'm very involved with the documentary film community, and so I know a lot of the filmmakers. They know me, and so they came to me with this project, and I was really floored because it was so exotic and interesting. And I also welcomed the idea of doing, eth you know, getting into the ethnic music of the place, incorporating elements wow. of that into the score. So I got on the phone and started researching, you know, Uzbeki, Uzbeki musicians and things like that. It was really fun. And nominated for an Emmy. Yeah, it's really great. The film is very popular. Um, it's been all over the world, and it's been on. It's played on independent lens on PBS, and now it's nominated for two Emmys. Big, big, big time. Yeah. We got an Emmy nominated girl in our house. <laughs> I like it. Um, Ethel Kennedy's. Uh, my mom grew up campaigning for the Kennedys, so they've always been close to my heart, and. Um, Tell us about that project, because that's been getting quite a lot of buzz. Yeah, it's had an incredible year at the festivals. It premiered at Sundance uh, last January, yep. and there were 25 people from the Kennedy family there. So wow. yeah, they, roll, and, they roll in packs. Yeah, and it was really funny <laughs> because they... Um, it's funny you were talking about Taylor Swift because she, for oh, some reason, right. of course, yeah, she's she now on the team. <laughs> yeah, she really liked <laughs> Ethel Kennedy, and she showed up for the premiere, which made this huge press event right. happen. So there we are at our premiere of the documentary. There's Kennedys, and then there's Taylor. <laughs> yeah, and she's in love with Ethel Kennedy. She sat next to her during the premiere, so it was really, really. Ethel is how old now? I think she's 83. Wow. What a woman. She's so amazing to be around. I mean, you know, she's been through so much. She's still very active and, and, and extremely involved in all kinds of human rights issues and things like that all over the world. So Rory, is this a project? Rory Kennedy, her daughter, directed yes. the film. Yes. And you've obviously done a bunch of films with Rory, right? Yes. Yeah. And so is this a project she'd always talk to you about doing? No, or? no. In fact, the story goes, you know, I mean, first of all, Rory is very, in, you know, she's done some, um, character-driven films, but a lot of the stuff we've done together has been more journalistic or like uh, like biographical about people like uh, Helen Thomas. Um, we did one about the border fence. And so, um, you know, she called me up one day and she said, well, I'm going to do a film about my mother. And I said, really? You're going to do a personal film? Because that's really not what she's been doing. <clears throat> and she said, no. <laughs> <laughs> I guess what happened was HBO asked her if she would do it. And she really thought her mother would say no. Um, and then what happened was her mother said yes, because she hadn't really been interviewed for about 30 years. Wow. So, um, and Rory felt very strongly, this is what she said, you know, she felt very strongly that if someone was going to do her mother's story, she She'd would rather her, it be yeah. her. Because it's, there's a lot of real sensitive subjects and she didn't want, you know, her mother, she wanted it to be dealt with in a delicate way, you know. How did you get into the documentary world? Oh, it's I want to know the journey. Well, you know, when I was in school, um, I was an anthropology student. I didn't really major in music. I didn't plan to be a musician. It just sort of happened. I always was doing music, but I, I wasn't really thinking of it as a career. And over the course of time, I fell into music, and I was doing a lot of stuff in bands. I was in the Mystic Knights, the Boingo. Which and, is like the coolest well, we thing get a time ever out on Boingo. in the history of the world. Yeah, How old did you play with uh, Danny As Ford. a singer and a horn player. Yes, it was really, really fun. And, this and in a gorilla suit. It was Oingo Boingo. This I know. is when it was pre, still. Pre Boingo. Yeah, it was exciting. Well, it started off, I was doing, I was in a uh, kind of a vaudeville feminist group called Alice Stone, and I used to write all the songs, and we did a lot of uh, satire and stuff like that, and riding the wave of feminism in the 70s. And so it was really fun, and one of their guys spotted me. They, they were, Danny was taking over the band from his brother Rick, and they were um, looking for female musicians. So they spotted me, and I went and auditioned. And the first day I was there, they handed me a tenor sax, which I had never even touched one. You wow. know, I'm a clarinet player. And so 
you know, right from there we went to Balafone and Gamelon, and I was like, oh my God, I'm in heaven. This is fantastic because I love ethnic music. I did a lot of ethnic stuff at UCLA when I was a student. So that's how I, oh, that's how I got in the Boingo. So then from the Boingo, I, I don't know, I, I was an activist also. I was always, I've always, always torn between doing music and doing, you know, being active in trying to change the world, especially when I was younger. So I, I fell into film scoring a long time ago, and I wasn't, I was doing a lot of like low budget horror movies and corporate videos and some circus. And then I did a documentary film, and it was like, oh my God, this is it. This is what I was born to do. You know, I get to write music and follow my passion, but also, you know, work on issue oriented films. Because it and, has an activism element to yeah, it. Yeah, and a lot of the films have, you know, I've worked on so many films that have actually been helpful in causing change and right. and really like I worked on Ghosts of Abu Ghraib with Rory I'm so proud of that because it was the first film that came out about what was going on oh. and um, she really did a terrific job with it it won an Emmy and um, so I was I'm so proud of the work I get to be part of you yeah know? It's, I like working on docs supervising docs because you yeah. fall into these worlds that you know not n know nothing about, but yeah. you get to learn. Well, it's the like depth a constant education. Yes. I'm always like now I know all about this art in Uzbekistan, Amazing. you know, and I know a lot about Abu Ghraib and all kinds of different things. It's always fascinating. And obviously Ethel. And Ethel, and yeah. And One Lucky Elephant is uh, one of my favorite films. I uh, that was a extreme passion project for me. Um, I've been writing music for a circus since 1988. They're in St. Louis. And when I, I, they had a baby elephant from the very beginning. I met her when she was about five. And I always was just fascinated with her. And what's it like to be the only con one of your own kind? And I, I always had really mixed feelings about seeing her in the circus. Right. When she was a baby, she actually, you know, they're, they're more playful and they enjoy it. But she grew up to be a 10,000 pound magnificent African elephant. And it became very clear that she was no longer interested in performing. and. Actually, it could have been dangerous, you know. Right. So the producer, David Balding of the circus, uh, he decided to retire her, and he said, I'm going to send her back to Africa. And I thought, oh, my God, I know all these documentary filmmakers. I've got to find somebody to do this story. And so I actually ended up co-producing the film. Oh, so you put that together? Yeah. And it's yeah. so oh, heartbreaking. I've never seen it, but that oh sounds amazing. Oh, my God, amazing. no, it's so heartbreaking because they bring her back to Africa, and, like, he has to say goodbye to her. Well, she doesn't ever get to Africa. But what it really became... But he has to say goodbye to her. Yes. Well, no, because she ends up in a sanctuary yeah. here. Spoiler alert. <laughs> I know. It's, and then he has to say goodbye to her, and they're like family. And Well, they're, you know, elephants really do create bonds. can't see her anymore. Yeah, and like, yeah. I cried. I mean, it's just beautiful. Well, originally we thought, and we actually got it funded as an adventure film following her back to Africa, but she never went to Africa. And it because? really ended up being a film exploring the ethics of animals in captivity, yeah. especially wild animals and whether or not they should be forced to perform and what is the you know the ethical what is the relationship humans have with animals and what is this desire we have to be close to wild animals and want, to, want them to love us the way we love them so it was really became very interesting and very different than what we set out to do and we all every one of us that worked on the film really had a, a we grew a lot you know we learned to we came to understand these issues and uh, we traveled to Europe and met with some of the Humane Society there, and it was—it's just been a really fascinating. And it sounds like great. You, it sounds like you love what you do, and you're oh, able to use your music yeah. to open all these different doors and get yeah, in there. Yeah, yeah. It, It's—it's really incredible to be able to to do the art that I love to do, and also be involved in. You know, I don't have to put the whole thing together usually. You know, I get to work sure. on something. And what's your primary else? instruments that you play? <laughs> <laughs> now it's the computer, you know, but uh, I started off in piano, clarinet, I played guitar, I did, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I'm one of those people that learns instruments quickly, not anymore, but when I was young I could sort of do anything, and, and, but never virtuosic, you know, I, I realized early on I wasn't going to ever be, like, I wanted to play like Charlie Parker more than anything, and that just, I practiced and practiced and it never happened. Didn't happen like Charlie. No. What, what other projects are you working on? Can you tell us of any? Um, yeah, well, um, I'm working on, uh, you know, I, it's, it's like I do these really serious projects. Like I'm working on one um, with these wonderful filmmakers, Michelle Stevenson and Joe Brewster. It's about race in America. And, and they basically, um, they followed their son for 12 years, a black kid, an African-American kid in a, in a white prep school. <laughs> And wow. um, it's a very personal look at race in our country and, and the deeper issues involved in, in how these kids go out into the world and, you know, how they're seen and perceived, you know, and, and, uh, and so that one's going to be on POV. It was a 12-year, they've been shooting for 12 years and now we're in post and 
we're working on that. Wow. And, well, and then this other one I'm doing is with this comedian, Emily Levine, who's really interested in science and cutting edge science. And so she's doing, she did a stage show about chaos theory and, and how it intersects with her own personal life and politics. Ah, the and so uh, it's really fun. There's animation, so I get to do some kind of wild, cartoonish kind of things. And it's fun. It's really fun. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. Yes, yeah, please really... keep us posted, and we will have our fingers crossed. Oh, for the Emmy time. Thank for you for the Emmy time. Me too. Thanks so much thank for coming. Thank you so much. In case you missed it. The Weekly Comet is now available on demand on EmpowerMe.tv. And don't forget to click subscribe so you can leave comments. Gotta subscribe to be in the game.